did that, I basically, weldability of different metals was one of the topics that I needed to cover. I ended up throwing in something on non-destructive testing, which we are going to cover, but, but I don't have to cover as much, and we end up spending more time on the material selection and the processing, quite a little bit than, than I expected because uh, we got uh, some full day diversions in these half hour classes, but that's okay. I mean, I actually prefer the diversions because I've heard the lectures before, believe me. <laughs> these lectures kind of get boring after a while. Uh, after the tw tenth time. You ready? Are you on? Um, let me just finish up on material selection and tell you a little bit about um, the world steel industry. I keep on hitting steel, but I've already told you it's 95 pounds of every pound, 100 pounds of metal made in the world. And you should now understand that it's because of this unique combination of strength, toughness, and cost. Okay? And we've already talked about the fact that if it doesn't, doesn't move, you don't care about, care about lightweight. And the Achilles heel of steel is it's heavy. And aluminum is lighter. But aluminum has one-tenth the toughness, roughly, as a piece of steel. And titanium has one-third or one-quarter the toughness of a piece of steel. Uh, aluminum can't reach the strength level of steel. Titanium can't. Titanium, you know, can, uh, but titanium in many cases exceeds the average strength level of, of the average structural steel. Nonetheless, because of the cost, which is partly because of the availability, iron's one of the most abundant elements on earth, um, and it's not as energy intensive to win it from its ore. Winning it from the ore means, you know, take the oxygen or sulfur away, in this case oxygen from the iron ores. Uh, it doesn't use anywhere near as much energy as titanium or aluminum or nickel. Uh, it's just a, a uh, easier material to work with. It turns out it's easier for other reasons. It's fabricability, it's repairability, and other things. There's a whole host of things. I've only kind of covered two or three of five or six kind of key things. The problem with the steel industry is everybody looks at it and says, oh, you're losing money. Uh, and yeah, they are losing money. The reason they're losing money, and we've talked about this before, is because it's such an important industry, everybody builds, builds one. And I think I mentioned before that the last integrated steel plant built by a private company was Bethlehem Steel building Burns Harbor, Indiana between 65 and 72 or about that, thereabouts. And Bethlehem Steel paid about $5 billion in that period. Back in the 60s, that was real money, as they say. As Everett Kirkson said, a billion here, a billion there, start, start talking about real money. Um, today, it would be cost about $15 billion to build an integrated steel plant. It's not to say it hasn't been built, but they've been built by countries not companies. Now, you'd say, well, this company built it, but the company is owned by the country, okay? I mean, it, Posco Steel was a partnership. It was quasi, it was mostly owned, it was majority owned when it started by the Korean government. And you look at uh, 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 China Steel, which is in Taiwan. The Taiwanese government backed all that with government financing. Uh, and so only governments can afford to take the multi-billion dollar risk of building a steel plant. We turns out because of productivity increases in the steel industry over the last 20 years, there is a, and because of this desire to everybody have their own, because everybody wants to export steel to the United States and improve their balance of trade, um, there is a tremendous worldwide overcapacity. We've got about, we're only at about 70% of capacity in the worldwide steel, steel industry. And you need to be at 80% or 85% to have a viable economic profit-making business in most industries. We have the exact same thing happening in semiconductor chips right now. Okay. This whole thing is called the tragedy of the commons. Has anyone ever heard of that? Uh, if you're really interested in philosophy, there's this paper written in, it's about 69 in Science Magazine called the tragedy of the commons. Um, and uh, if you read the original essay, the guy is a real, uh, redneck, but um, uh, but basically the tragedy of the commons is if something is um, if some if everybody wants something everybody goes after it stores it you know hoards it whatever and it becomes common and its value is debased. I mean it originally had a high value, but because it has a high value, everybody wants it, so it, everybody produces it. It becomes uh, uh, low in value and. Um, basically everything is, is wasted. Um, and you can talk about the commons, you can talk about the tragedy of 
commons is in overlogging, okay, you know, forestry or, or things like that. Uh, but in any case, that's the little theory of economics and social responsibility, which doesn't belong in the welding course, I guess. Um, but it turns out what happened was the American steel industry, which I think I pointed out to you, had 75% of the world's capacity after World War II, but we bombed out everything else, dropped to about 25% in the mid-70s when I worked in the U.S. steel industry, and it's about 10% today. The capacity in the world is about eight to 900 million tons of steel capacity. We're using about 700 million or so, uh, or 650 million, depending on how you count, um, tons. And so everybody's cutting the prices because what happens is these other these other countries, whether it's a semiconductor plant or a steel plant, they go borrow the money to build these things. A similar thing happened in shipbuilding, commercial shipbuilding. You know, the Japanese had a very good uh, market in the 60s and 70s. In the 80s, the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Chinese and the Romanians all decided they were going to get into shipbuilding. The United States basically couldn't couldn't afford to compete. These people took it over and. Um, Hyundai and Samsung and these Korean steel companies, uh, not steel companies, but uh, shipyards, basically had borrowed money, so much money to build a shipyard that even when the price went down, the demand went down, they had to keep building ships because they had to pay the interest on the loans. Even if they were making ships at a loss, it's basically just an internal government thing. Um, you still want to employ your people and generate enough um, external revenue, external uh, 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 dollars to be able to pay the interest on your international loans. And so even though you're, you're losing money big time as a company, when you're backed by the government and they can just print more yuan, then uh, you know, it's, it works for a while. And, uh, it worked for about 20 years, 15 or 20 years, and now you see the Korean economy um, uh, having serious problems. People didn't think that was a problem in Japan, but to a certain extent that was the problem in Japan. Uh, as well. Japan's big problem is they, all right, I think I already told you, is their inherent in, inefficiency. They want to have 30% of their populace in farming when you only need 3% of your populace in farming. So to say I'm going to be 30% inefficient on a national scale is sort of a burden for the, to be able to compete uh, no matter how efficient your industry is. In any case, the American steel industry um, was faced with <coughs> extinction in the 19, early 1980s. And so at the time, they were at about 16 man hours per ton. It turns out that um, during the 1980s, they doubled their productivity. Um, and uh, actually, that was the mid 70s, they were at 16. Anyway, they went from 16 to the early 90s, maybe 50, closer to 15 or 20 year period. They went from 16 person hours per ton to one person hour per ton. And today it's down at like 0.6 person hours per ton. Now compare that to um, uh, Saugus Ironworks here in the early 1600s where it was probably something on the order of one person year per ton. So you're talking two or 3,000 hours per ton. Over time, the productivity of, of um, the steel industry maybe not quite as dramatic in terms of transistors on a chip productivity, it still has been a pretty dramatic productivity change. And in fact, uh, even within uh, the last 20 years, the productivity has, has uh, uh, improved by about twofold a decade or better. Um, that's not the best industry in the United States. What, anybody have an idea of which industry had the greatest productivity gains in the United States uh, over the last 20 years? One of the even more, can you think of an industry that's more maligned than the steel industry or the metals industry? Automobile? No, they, 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 they've done about a factor of two over 20 years. They, they have, they've done well, but the, no. the mining industry, you didn't even know we had one. It's because almost no one works in it anymore because the productivity has gone up by a factor of four, uh, or th about three per decade. I mean, they've had about a tenfold improvement in the mining industry. Again, the problem was, you're going to be out of business. It used to cost about $50 a ton to mine coal. Um, and today, well, what happened is the Venezuelans were starting big mines, and they had big mines actually in the, in the Midwest, uh, 
basically strip mines uh, for, for uh, brown coal that could mine the coal at four dollars a ton. There's almost no people involved. I mean, there's two people, but it's mostly big equipment. Uh, and they invested, and this is typical type of thing in any, in any industry. A lot of people, rather than going out of business, will actually innovate. You know, you know, uh, turns out the threat of extinction is sharp as the mine. So it turns out uh, Chaparral Steel is an interesting example of a mini mill. Um, and the mini mills started in the 19, uh, about 19, or early 1970s. And it turns out there's actually a couple of MIT people, graduates of this department, who, who did it because they, they realized that the cast iron that you make steel from was costing $180 a ton in the early 70s. That's for the liquid metal. Turns out you could buy scrap steel, which all you had to do was melt and you ended up with steel, for $100 a ton. So on a $400 a ton product, you had an $80 a ton savings if you just used arc melting as opposed to the other ways to melt steel, or to make steel from, from the ore. Um, so that was pretty significant. Anyway, Chaparral is, is one of these little mini mills. They have, they're about one and a half million tons per year down in Midlothian, Texas. Uh, in 1990, they were down to one man hour per ton, which at the time was about, about the most efficient in the world. The Japanese big integrated producers were still around one and a half, two person hours per ton. They ended up developing, um, to get that productivity, uh, things like net shape casting. And I just want to give you an example of some of these things. Early on, this was the first net shape casting. We talked about continuous casting. And that's not the greatest. Let me turn off the light over here. Um, um, <coughs> Instead of having a rectangular continuous <laughs> cast loom, they basically made a dog bone shape. And that meant that you could roll structural I beams, which is their product, uh, one of their products, two main products, uh, more efficiently. In fact, they could roll in something like nine passes through the mill as opposed to 28 passes. And so within um, about five years of being able to do this, uh, the big structural mills at Bethlehem Steel and the big integrated producers who are using 28 passes through the mill because they start out with big rectangular slabs rather than dog bones, basically went out of business. And the price of structural steel went from $600 a ton to $300 a ton. And it's gone down even lower, down around below 250 in some cases, which is pretty incredible because in 1980 it was selling for $600 a ton. And today it sells for like $250 a ton for the same product, and we're not doing any discounting for inflation here. So it's more than a factor of two and a half. Why? Because the productivity is improved by a factor of four, you can drop your price significantly. So that's their dog bone shape, um, and that was around 1990. If you go to Chaparral uh, later, they improved it. This is the continuous cast, I think, did that show this before? With the arch assembly cutting, but here's, the, here's a nearly net shape I beam down here. So maybe I did show that before. I don't know. 75% um, energy shape savings. Um, uh, you get fine grain, all chill fats, high toughness. Uh, so Chaparral had some significant improvements. Now, other ways that people have improved the productivity, and Chaparral originally started out trying to make rebar. Rebar is concrete reinforcing bar. That's you know, the stuff that's just big round bar and it's got these kind of uh, diamond patterns of ribs on there that will you just cast the concrete around it. The ribs grab the concrete. It's mechanical interlocking, if you will. And that's how you get the tensile strength of concrete. Chaparral started out, or actually all the mini mills started out in rebar because it's the garden variety, it's the garbage variety steel, not garden variety. It's the garbage variety steel. <laughs> the only requirement of rebar <laughs> is that it have a certain strength and it be able to be bent with heat. Well, anything can be done with heat, you know, practically, uh, unless it burns up. And certain, so any piece of steel. So rebar, as long as it's got strength, it doesn't matter what the composition is, it's too much. Um, and so they could make it in the early um, furnaces. And the, pro the problem with rebar was um, rebar was low cost steel. It was $300 a ton before, now it's down about $200 a ton. The problem is when you're rolling this stuff in the rolling mill, you're hot rolling it, it doesn't matter whether you're making number eight rebar. Number eight rebar, rebar is sized by eighths of an inch of diameter. So number eight is one inch diameter of rebar. Uh, 
Uh, number three rebar is the smallest. That's three eighths of an inch rebar. Very small stuff. And you can get rebar up to like 18, which is two and a, two and a quarter inch diameter rebar. That's, I, I've only seen that once or twice. Um, in any case, you get a significant premium, or you used to get a significant premium for three eighths inch rebar, like an extra hundred dollars a ton. Why? Because you can't get as many tons to the mill when you're rolling something small as when you're rolling something big. It takes more time in the mill, more time in the mill increases the cost. And so one of the things Chef Ralph did is they used to have their mill operators go spend a week with the salespeople each year and visit the salespeople. When the mill operators realized, gee, we could make 50% more, and these guys are on a profit sharing plan, they decided, well, we want to make, we want to sell the 3 8 inch rebar. We don't care about the big stuff. We want to, we want to make that kind of stuff faster. So they tried to speed up the mill. Well, they're already going about 60 miles an hour through there. And you try to speed up much faster, and all of a sudden you get in all kinds of instabilities. And they weren't the first people who ever had this idea. And that's the problem. Most people think, oh, I've got a great idea. Well, yeah, well, were you the first to have that idea? You know, uh, there are a few other smart people out there in the world. Well, the problem is they couldn't go any faster. So it's kind of interesting. They decided, well, if I can't go faster, can I go slower? And by slower, they decided, well, I can only get one strand through the mill at a time, the way I've been doing it conventionally. But if I take that one strand and I actually split it while it's hot into two strands, and then take those two strands and split them into four, I can get four times as much through and go half the speed. And so they get twice the output. So the purpose of this little story is to remind you is usually the answer doesn't lie in trying to think of how do I just kind of make an incremental improvement. The really innovative answer doesn't isn't just an incremental improvement on what's already going on. Um, I've sort of made a career of going in the opposite direction of where everyone else is going. And the way I explain this is is uh, uh, is Easter egg hunts. When I was in second grade. We had an Easter egg hunt, and I'm you know sitting there with the old basket, walking around the yard, and all these other kids, all everybody's looking for the Easter eggs, and some kid says, "Oh, I found one!" So what happens? Just like a, a ten-year-old soccer game, they all run the Easter egg, right? Well, I was kind of far away, so by the time I got there, I was looking at everyone's behind, right? I thought, I realized I'm not going to find an Easter egg. There's there's another twenty eyes here looking in the same area. I'm going to go look on the other side of the yard where no one is. Okay, so you actually can find the gems where no one else is looking. Don't work on old plowed fields. Work on fields that are that are uh, new that no one else has looked for something, and you have a better chance of finding something. Go in the opposite direction of conventional thought. Okay, if you want to be creative, head the opposite direction. Um, steel is important. Roger Kipling knew it. He said, "Gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade." Good said the Baron, sitting in his hall. But iron, cold iron, is master of them all. So you should know why iron is master of the, of the metals world today. You should actually also know why metals are masters of the structural materials business um, today because of the combination of strength and uh, toughness. Um, any questions? So I've hammered steel hard enough to should be forged into your, your beam. Okay? You know, the Army did a study a few years ago, about seven or eight years ago, what would be the, the primary material of use of the U.S. Army for the future? They probably spent several millions of dollars doing this big study. Guess what they came up with? Steel. Okay. Could have told them, you know, if they give me the million dollars, you know, I could have told them the answer before that. Um, no one would believe me, but they had to do the study, right? Okay, let's get into welding of steels, and then we'll go through aluminum, and we'll go through titanium, and some of the other materials. <coughs> Since steel is 95 pounds out of all metals made, 100 pounds of metals made, it is important. Steel is interesting because it, if you look at the phase diagram, iron and carbon, that's all steel is, is an alloy of iron and carbon. And we can throw other things in there, but iron and carbon are alloys of less than 1%, this is 0.8%. So if you're less than about 1%, it's about 1%. Uh, there are very few steels that go above 1% carbon. 
most of the structural steels, construction steels, are what we call low carbon steels, which is below about 0.25 carbon, below a quarter percent carbon. They're over here. And one of the interesting things about all this is, well, you know, you melt at 1536 degrees centigrade, you have, and you have another transformation up there, but we don't have to worry about that. Um, we have gamma iron, base center cubic iron, um, at above 910 degrees centigrade, above 723, which is 1350, we will transform at what we call the eutectoid to the body center cubic form of iron. There's a phase, tra phase transformation that involves a change in volume. It changes the uh, uh, microstructure of the steel. You, you nucleate new grains of this new crystal, and those new grains are what produce this very distinct heat affected zone. So that's a nice sharp line on that heat affected zone that, that this thing would best run. Yeah. Is, is that what they call martensite? No. Um, martensite is a metal stable phase, which they sometimes call alpha prime, if they're using the, the numbers. This is phase center cubic, this is body center cubic. Martensite is if you quench this from up here down to room temperature quickly, quickly enough, and quickly enough depends on the steel and what other alloying elements are there. But typically for just a straight iron carbon alloy, like automotive body sheet, quickly is in less than a second or two. If you're talking about a 4340, it could be several tens of seconds that you have to be quick. If you're talking about uh, a Martin Sittig stainless steel, it can be minutes because you've got so much chromium around it, slows down the reaction to martensite. But martensite is a body-centered tetragonal. It's not cubic, it's just slightly strained in one direction, okay? Because the carbon pushes it in one direction. Um, and so it has a preferred orientation. You get these needles of this phase, and these interlocking kind of structures, and the martensite is very hard, very brittle, uh, but very strong. If you now temper that, so that you diffuse a little bit of the carbon out and relieve some of the strain in those crystals, you can end up with something that's incredibly tough as well as strong and has a very fine grain size. And remember, grain size is one of the keys to all of this. Grain size gives you both strength and toughness. It's the only thing that we know of that gives both strength and toughness of the same size. Small grain size is good, okay? And so a lot of what we do in steels, we talked about controlled rolling and stuff, Talk about quench and tempered steels. Quench and tempered steels are martensite steels. You quench them to form the martensite, you temper them to get back some of the toughness. You lose a little bit of the strength, you get back some of the toughness. You can make martensite steels of 300 KSI strength. Now, a typical structural steel rebar, well, rebar is about 60 KSI. The old 836 structural steel is 36 KSI yield. Typically, we're using 50 KSI construction steels today in most bridges and buildings. Uh, the Navy's been using 80 KSI from the 50s, mid 50s through the uh, uh, around 1995 for submarine hull construction. Now they're at 100 KSI. They like to go to 130 KSI in steels. In the 60s they developed 180 KSI steel. Just it's too expensive for anyone to use. It's not very weldable. But, um, so welding is actually a problem as you get to higher and higher strengths. But you can make forged steel of 280, 300 KSI, and we use that for aircraft landing gears. Okay? And that's quenched and tempered Martin steel. So you can get a tenfold range of strength in steel, in bulk steel. When you get that tenfold increase in strength, that means your critical flaw size has gone down by a factor of 100, right? J is equal to sigma square by C. So you have to do very good inspection on aircraft landing gears. Okay? So you can get high strength if you're paying the price for it. Just in general, we can easily, relatively easily use 100 KSI strength construction steels today. The Navy uses it for submarine hulls up to four inches thick. That's not the average thickness of a submarine hull, by the way. But they do have four inch, actually I think they even have six inch foundations in some of the units. But four inches is about typically about the thickest. And I can't tell you the actual thickness of the hull because it's classified. And I'm not supposed to know it. And I don't know it. So you can figure it out other ways. Um, <laughs> I don't know it from an official source. Um, 
but really, the thing's really classified as the depth the capability. Uh, but once you know the thickness, you can see the depth. So it's all related. And as well, they have built whole buildings down electric boat such that when these big rings are turned on their side, it's covered by a building because they don't want the satellites from the other side to be able to take a picture and measure the thickness of the steel. That's pretty terrible. So they can do it. Okay, so, or they were going to be able to do it. In any case, this transformation is very important um, and, and uh, controls a lot of the grain size of the steels. And we'll talk about some more about that on Friday and the types of defects that form in steels what we do to uh, control those in well. Okay? Not here today. I'm going to buy a new... Ask more questions, then I'll think of my old stories. The problem is I have told some of the stories for building this. Okay, we want to talk a little bit about weldability of steels. Um, and we were starting to talk about, we talked about the iron carbon phase diagram. Steel melts in 1536, but in fact, there's this transformation between seven and 900 degrees. Your low carbon steels, this is 0.8% carbon. Your low carbon steels are basically below about a quarter percent carbon. And those are the ones that you prefer to weld. In fact, the easiest to weld is low carbon, then medium carbon. High carbon steels are a pain in the neck to weld. And cast irons are worse. Cast irons, if you move this phase diagram out, not from point 8% to about 3% carbon, you get to cast irons. <coughs> and the cast irons are terrible to weld. Um, you have to do all kinds of things. There are a number of different types of defects that occur in welding. Uh, cracking being one of the most significant. This has been around for about 20 some years. Uh, the British Welding Institute put together this little booklet on faults and fusion, fusion welds and constructional steels. It's just a, a bunch of pictures of the types of defects that someone can find. So here's solidification cracks, there's a typical type of hydrogen cracking, there's lamellar tearing, which is this stuff right here. Um, and I'll pass this around. But basically, solidification cracking is not very common if, if you have too much phosphorus. Actually, it can be a problem in a shipyard because um, you are prepaint the steel plate so it doesn't rust. So it's got a pre-painted layer that tends to have an iron phosphide in the paint, which is a corrosion pre preventer. And if you try to weld over the primer, which you can do, um, you now get more phosphorus in your weld, and phosphorus will lead to solidification cracking in steel because it's too high. So you gotta use the right flux and weld and consumables. Uh, for most military construction, you gotta grind your paint off because you can't tolerate that phosphorus for the high strength steels. But for a commercial shipbuilding, uh, typically, they do a lot of welding from primers nowadays. You got to make sure that the primer doesn't go on too thick, because if you have two mil thick coating of primer rather than one mil, you got to try twice as much phosphorus in the steel, and you can get solidification cracking. However, the next type of cracking, hydrogen-induced heat effect is on cracking, which we'll talk about. Hydrogen-induced weld metal cracking, which is the same. Lamellar tearing, which is just another form of hydrogen cracking, and reheat cracking, which is actually something a little bit different. Then they have cavities, just like you cavities in your teeth, I guess. They have about five or six different types of cavities. Um, the cavities are often, uh, the porosity in steels is often due to air getting into the process. Because nitrogen in steel will end up with, you'll end up with Swiss cheese. But it can come out in various different ways. Inclusions, typical inclusions are if you weld over your flux and the flux doesn't come out like it should. Lack of fusion, lack of penetration, that's basically you don't melt the side the sides or you don't melt deep enough. And then imperfections in shape, the weld, the liquid weld slumps to one side or have excess weld metal or whatever. And then there's some miscellaneous faults. Um, but in any case, there's a copy. Here's another copy. <laughs> Used to have another copy. That's but this is a better copy. They don't sell that anymore. It's on glossy paper. Now they sell the cheap one. Paper. But it's the same pictures. Uh, here's a book in its fourth edition, which was about 1980. The first edition, I don't have the first edition, but I have the second, third, and fourth. This is 1987. Uh, Weldability of Steels. Um, 
the only thing that's useful today about this book, well actually there's two things. If you want to do a historical study of what types of cracking tests we used to do for hydrogen, there it is. Um, but the thing that's useful, the reason I pick up this book, aside from showing it to students, is the appendix in the back. There's this 80-page uh, appendix, which has the welding parameters for virtually any steel you can think of. So, you know, four or five times a year, I get somebody who calls me up and says, I need a welding procedure uh, for a steel that we're welding. And I say, well, what's the composition? Uh, when was it made? Now, typically, these are people around here who, uh, they're repairing some building in downtown Boston, was the most recent one. Uh, and the building was built in the, eight, in the 1880s. And they want to, they want to weld some new columns to the old steel beams. And they said, well, what welding procedure do they use? I said, well, <clears throat> for something that old, you've got to get me a chemistry. You've got to cut out a sample and tell me what the composition of the steel is. Because back then, it could be a medium carbon steel, which is much more difficult to weld. It could also, if it's really 1880s, it could be one that doesn't have the right manganese to sulfur ratio. Um, and if you have, you have to have about seven times as much manganese as you have sulfur in your steel. Not a problem today. In any commercial steel today, you got 20 or 30 times as much manganese as you have sulfur. But back in the old days, that wasn't true. You get manganese sulfide uh, uh, cracking problems if you don't have enough manganese. You actually get iron sulfide cracking problems because the manganese is not tying up all the sulfur. But, so there's, there's little things you have to know about that for the really old stuff. The new stuff, if you just tell me, well, first of all, the new stuff, why are you calling me? Just go to the, uh, the steel company that's selling it. They'll tell you what your welding procedures are. That's what I did. One of the first jobs I had when I worked for a steel company was developing welding procedures for, for new types of steels. And how do you do it? Uh, well, the main problem is hydrogen cracking. And hydrogen cracking is related, well, there's three, three things to hydrogen cracking. There is, I'd like to draw the old Venn diagram here. You have to have hydrogen, or you won't have hydrogen cracking. That's pretty good. You have to have stress, and you have to have a susceptible microstructure. Micro so okay, and we talked about this when I told you about the chrome molly steel and the uh, shipyard, the boilers and stuff. And they were having hydrogen cracking. They had a susceptible microstructure, but I couldn't change the steel. That was what the designer designed the boiler out of. I couldn't get it any lower in hydrogen, and the only thing I could do was change the joint design for the stress. And it worked, fortunately. I didn't go out looking like a fool, I walked out of Euro. And I was the only one I knew that I didn't have a foggiest idea where this was. Um, but in fact, you have to have a sufficient quantity of all of these to get hydrogen cracking. Well, it turns out susceptible microstructure, um, the big problem here is what we call the carbon equivalent. How hardenable is the steel? Higher strength steels will produce greater residual stresses. That pushes up the other circle, right? And increases the propensity. It turns out that martensitic steels, I talked about, someone asked about question tempered steels, and those are the martensitic steels. They have fantastically small grain size, therefore they have great toughness and great strength um, properties. However, that particular microstructure is the most susceptible microstructure to hydrogen cracking. So you got high strength to begin with, you also have a microstructure that's more susceptible. Typically, we, we are worried about hardnesses or stresses, strengths of the steel when we get above Rockwell C30. And Rockwell C30 is about 120 KSI, roughly. Um, typically an HY130 is going to be a Rockwell C33, definitely susceptible. An HY80 is going to be a Rockwell C28, it's getting up there. you got serious problems with Rockwell C30 and above. Um, once Rockwell C30 uh, uh, shafting in medium carbon steels like 4340 might be heat treated to a Rockwell C38 or something like that, 180 KSI. Uh, for a 4340 shaft or something. Um, turns out in the gas pipeline business, 
they don't want anything greater than Rockwell C23 because they have hydrogen sulfide, and the hydrogen sulfide causes a corrosion problem, which leads to hydrogen introduction, and so they try to keep it below Rockwell C23. That's getting to be a problem because now you're getting to a level of around 90 KSI, and you're trying to get 70 KSI in your base material, and you don't want your well material or anything else to exceed 90, you've got a very narrow range to, uh, to select your materials. But in general, anytime you hear, you check the hardness on a steel, and that's the other thing is, I, um, I say, well, get me a chemistry of the steel, tell me what the hardness is, is the next thing. There's only two tests I need to do uh, to, to, to determine the weldability of the steel, uh, in general. Uh, and in general, is 99% of the time. Um, if you do a hardness and it's above Rockwell C30, you gotta start sharpening your pencil and, and be careful about what you do. Generally, if you're below Rockwell C30, it's hard to get hydrogen cracking. It's just not that easy. But hydrogen cracking comes from the fact that the hydrogen will dissolve more in the liquid steel than in the, uh, the solid steel. And that's okay, except that as it cools down to room temperature, the hydrogen can still move around and diffuse out of the, or diffuse in the steel. And it will go to the inclusions or other flaws in the steel and it will promote whatever mechanism of cracking the steel wants to do under whatever stress that it's in. If I have residual stresses in the steel, and I have hydrogen, and I have a susceptible microstructure that's above Rockwell C30, I've got good potential for hydrogen cracking. And it's sometimes called delayed cracking because it may not occur for four hours or 24 hours or 48 hours after doing the welding. Uh, and in fact, in the shipyard, anybody here from the subyard? How long do you wait before you do your own structure testing on the welds? Usually they want it 24 hours and then a week. A week, exactly. There's, there's one, yeah, yeah, I didn't realize you did it 24 in a week, but the week is the one I'm thinking of. The reason you wait for a week, uh, you can do one at 24 just to make That's sure they get the weld. You need to, you don't have to wait a week to find out the <laughs> Yeah, okay. I didn't realize they were doing that. But turns out they wait a week because some of them don't show up until 48 hours. Uh, I, in fact, most, but most of them show up in 24 hours. It depends on the strength level. The higher strength level in general, the faster they'll show up. Uh, rarely do they show up in less than an hour. Typically, in heat treating of parts in industry, where let's say they've uh, pickled the parts, they put them in an acid bath to clean the surface, and they have to put them in if it's a high strength bolt or a, a heat treated part, the specs typically say you have to put them in a furnace to bake out the hydrogen, typically at 375F, so you can put them in your oven at home, if you want, along with your cookies or whatever, um, for anywhere from three to 24, 23 hours, or four, four to 24 hours. Uh, why do they, uh, I'm sorry, four to 23 hours. Uh, the reason you do 23 hours is that gives you a furnace load every day. Right? You put it in the furnace, and that gives you one hour change over the next day. So you get a furnace load every day. It's the, way, the reason they say 23 hours. But you have to bake out the hydrogen. The hydrogen will diffuse out at room temperature, but it can take day, several days or up to a week to diffuse out of the steel. If the steel's not very thick, like one inch thick, uh, you can typically diffuse it out to a low enough level that it's no longer susceptible. The hydrogen circle shrinks on that diagram as you get the hydrogen out. But in fact, cracking can occur up to several days later. Um, the typical specs on heat treating in shops, after you do something that will introduce hydrogen, such as electroplating something on the surface or pickling the surface, you have to put it in the oven within one to four hours. And the reason for that is because if you wait any longer, the hydrogen will move around and will have done its damage and start to crack. I mean, I've heard stories of the shut the subyard of people, you know, working on the night shift and they hear this, it's like a rifle shot go off in the shop. And what it is, is a eight foot long crack just went through the foundation and it's been welded that afternoon. Okay, so seven or eight hours later, the hydrogen gets a brittle fracture and it just, bang, you know, the residual stresses in that complex egg crate type of construction just bang, let's go. They don't really have that much anymore, um, but, that's one of the things you're concerned about.
So it's called hydrogen cracking or delayed cracking. You try to get the hydrogen down to the lowest possible level. Um, the lowest possible level in most welding is on the order of a couple parts per million of hydrogen in the steel, two, two, one to two parts per million. Typical, if I'm welding with a low hydrogen electrode, like a 7018, this is a stick electrode, I might, and I have a good process, I might be able to get down as low as five parts per million with this electrode. The problem is this flux coating on the outside uh, carries moisture in it. And you have to stick these things in the oven. The subyard, what, four hours out of the oven? Or what? Okay. Uh, I've been in some shops on more difficult steels where one hour out of the oven. I've been in some shops where the guys have ovens that they, you know, they have a, you know, basically they're wired. They have an oven right there and you take it right out of the oven. Uh, that's for chrome molly steels uh, in a nuclear plant or something like that. Um, but about four hours out. Uh, uh, so. uh, it's about 300 degrees out. It's not terribly hot. You're just keeping the moisture off. Um, uh, although they have baked it, they may have baked this particular one at five or six hundred degrees. Now, this is a 16. This is a 6011. This is called a cellulosic. This generates about 20 or 30 parts per million hydrogen. So you can't use it on high strength steels. And the reason is the flux coating is cellulose. This is a, a bigger electrode, stick electrode. A, this is about one. This is not the largest made. This is a, the smallest of the large ones. Um, this is a 36 inch electrode, and they use this in steel mills. It takes a couple of thousand amps, and it's not run by a man. It's run by a machine, and they clamp it, put the current up here, and they basically repair castings, great big steel castings, by just puddling, you know, melting a bunch of steel. But you got a flux coating on this. Uh, those flux coatings um, are important because they exclude the atmosphere. Uh, back when they first started getting welding power supplies uh, in, uh, in the 1880s, and it turns out one of the uh, big name people was the founder of the American Welding Society was uh, Professor at Harvard, a professor of electrical engineering, and basically he designed a generator in the 1880s or 1890s. His name was Comfort Adams, and during World War II, uh, World War I, he was head of the Emergency Fleet Corporation. Remember, he had to get the, boy, he get the boys over there, right? He had to build ships to do it. So in 1917, they decided, we got to build some ships. And they didn't, what was the cheapest way to build ships? They had actually developed welding, and they had stick electrodes at that time. Um, they had, the, uh, the earlier electrodes were just bare steel wires before 1900. Uh, and with a bare steel wire, yes, you can you can weld, but there's all kinds of nitrogen there, you get Swiss cheese. All great big bubbles, so far as that goes. Uh, it turns out that two things happened. In the United States, one guy, and I don't know who it was, um, found that if you wrapped a piece of paper around the electrode, you would get rid of these pores, these bubbles, Swiss cheese in the weld. And that was the beginning of cellulosic electrodes, which are the E60 series, typically, of electrodes. This is a 6011, 6010, 60, so it says 6011 on it, 6013. Uh, um, and the 60 means 60,000 uh, tensile strength of the steel. So this is a low strength steel electrode, the lowest strength you can get, uh, but it runs very well. Okay, just, you don't have to have, no. Uh, well, well, it has to have some skill, but, but these things, uh, as they say, run very well. Um, and if you're not worried about hydrogen cracking, you can use them. But this produces an atmosphere of burning the cellulose that's about 60% hydrogen. And that will put 20 ppm hydrogen into your well pool. The same, about the same time, in the early 1900s in Sweden, um, there was a guy welding and he with bare wires, and he found that if he stuck his electrode in the mud and welded with the muddy electrode, the Swiss cheese went away. And that was the beginning of mineral shielded electrodes like the 7018s. Okay. 7018 is one of the most common low hydrogen uh, electrodes. Um, it turns out that guy who stuck his electrode in the mud, the successor to that is the ESOP Corporation today. Okay. He basically learned how to make welding electrodes by sticking them in the mud. Now, the flux formulations are still 
sort of a uh, black art. One company uses, for their cellulose, uses uh, old tobacco stalks. The reason they do is because tobacco plants tend to concentrate the rubidium in the soil, and so they get a little bit of rubidium, and that helps the stability of the arc. Because rubidium's in what's called one of the periodic table. It gives off electrons very easily. It's got a single electron on the outer shell, and it's down, it's a heavy element. And that, that means that the outer electron is bound less tightly. So rubidium helps with arc starting. And you can get that by using old tobacco stalks, and no one else has any use for old tobacco stalks, right? So um, it turns out for mineral coated electrodes, they find in the formulation that they can only use a mineral from a certain mine or a certain part of a mine in some place. So um, it really is a black art and they have to reformulate them all the time. Um, but those are, that's stick electrodes, so far as that goes, in their history. The, uh, they have relatively high hydrogen. It's hard to get below five parts per million hydrogen with stick electrodes. If you want to go to gas metal arc welding, which is a bare wire process where you have an argon shield, which is what we use mostly in the shipyards today, partly because the stick electrode, you can only get a maximum of 25 to 30% arc time. If a guy is welding and he's got someone else to do the grinding and everything else, and they're just trying to lay down metal, well, first of all, they have to change you know, electrodes. They have to stop and chip the, chip the slag off because the flux forms a little slag on the surface. Turns out 30% arc time is, and I've measured it, is about the fastest anyone could go. Typical type of arc time could be five or 10% if the person in their own doesn't have a helper taking care of all the other things. They gotta move the ladder over here. If you're a guy doing piping, it might be less than 5% because you gotta do all the fitting and everything else that you've been uh, going on. With gas metal arc, where you have an automatic gun that just feeds the steel wire and you have a, a shielding gas around the nozzle of the whole thing, to protect it from the atmosphere, you can get 60% arc time. So obviously you get much better productivity. Turns out you also get lower hydrogen. There's no flux to carry the moisture around. You don't have problems with the moisture. Um, so typically shipyards, because of both productivity and naval shipyards, higher strength steel and avoiding hydrogen cracking, they've gone to uh, 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 gas mill arc well. If you go to gas tungsten arc welding, gas tungsten arc, instead of having a consumable steel electrode, has a non-consumable tungsten electrode, and now you have argon shielding. That will get you down to the one part per million range. And the people that were doing those chrome molly boilers I talked about before, they were using gas tungsten arc. They couldn't get any lower hydrogen. There is no process that gives you lower hydrogen. So that's why I couldn't pump them on lowering the hydrogen. If I look at the various types of steels, we have HSLA steels, which stands for high strength low alloy. We have TMCP, thermomechanically uh, something processed, controlled process, I guess. Low carbon steels, chrome moly steels, which are boiler steels, quenched and tempered steels, which are HY steels. And I'm not sure what HTLA steels are. Uh, I have to go back and look in the book. Um, but basically, you're looking at carbon content versus what we call carbon equivalent. And zone three is very susceptible to cracking. Here's your HY steels, your H HY80s and HY100s. Um, if you look at your HSLA steels, the HSLA steels are in here, zones two and three, hopefully down over here. The uh, uh, down here, which, oh, TC, TMCP, these are what we call the ultra low carbon benetic steels, which now the Navy calls HSLA100 is down here, you're getting the carbon down very low. Zone one down here, very low carbon, but you have high carbon equivalent. Turns out that's very weldable. That's the most, these, these are, zones one and two are the most weldable steels. Um, so you'd like to be down in here, low carbon, low carbon equivalent, unless you're down at the very low carbon, less than a tenth of a percent, in which case you can go way out here on what your carbon, you can have very high alloy contents, get a lot of strength but not be susceptible to hydrogen cracking. So carbon equivalent has to do with carbon content and... A bunch of other things. It has to do with carbon content. Well, it changes the microstructure. 
what's really, this plot's really showing you is differences in microstructure. Those, those ovals are all differences in microstructure. The carbon equivalent is a measure of the hardenability of the steel. How readily is it going to form Rockwell C30? Okay, it turns out that carbon equivalent, one formula is it's the carbon, the carbon equivalent is equal to the carbon plus the manganese over six plus the silicon over 24 plus the nickel over 40, chrome over five. Actually, in your handouts, you have a whole sheet that gives you carbon equivalent values. Okay. A bunch of, bunch of different formulas, okay? I mean, they're empirical formulas, okay? This is one formula. This is one of the old formulas. Really applies up in that, in the zone two and three area. Turns out down in the zone one area, these ultra low carbon benedict seals, they've only been around from a research point of view, for 10 or 15 years, basically. Well, those good well you can get you can HFLA 100, you know, 100 KSI yield steel that's very well. Very expensive because you've got like four or five percent total alloying elements. I mean, you've got lots of nickel and, and other things in these things. Carbon is down very low. You get a very different microstructure. It's a benitic rather than a martensitic. What's the difference between bainite and martensite? Bainite forms at a slightly higher temperature. It's, an, it's a metastable crystal structure. It's body centered tetragonal, similar to martensite, but it's slightly different. And um, it was discovered by Edgar Bain, who was a metallurgist for US Steel in the 1930s. Uh, but people are just now starting to commercialize some of these ultra low carbon benedict steels. They're actually invented in the 70s, uh, as far as that goes, by some of the Japanese. But uh, they, there's a, there's a host of different steel uh, microstructures, but the big problem is trying to control these things, and we'll talk next time about how I use these other things to try to control them. Did I, did I answer your question on the carbon equivalent? Sure. The carbon equivalent is a measure of how much alloying element you have in the steel, and that increased alloying element makes it more hardenable, it makes it easier to get Rockwell C30. So the higher the carbon equivalent, the more difficult it is to weld because the more likely you're going to get high strain, too high strain. You just answered what I was going to say. So you want low carbon equivalent and low carbon contact in the welding, right? Yes. And even though steel is a mixture of iron and carbon, the goal is to get the carbon as low as practical while maintaining the strength. The problem is carbon tends to control the strength. So you need the carbon for strength. But you don't want it for weldability because you thought when you weld and the weld cools more quickly than the original stick product, the weld zone is very very hard, too hard, and then it's brittle, and uh, and you get hydrogen susceptibility to hydrogen crack. Uh, so you like to push the carbon down as low as possible for weldability, but you got to have some in there to get the strength. How about toughness? How does it affect toughness? Carbon is detrimental to toughness. Um, now, see, the thing with the ultra low carbon benedict, you got a new structure, and some of these rules don't no longer apply. But the ultra low carbon benedicts, the only way you get the benedict microstructure is you get the carbon down ultra low, and now you have to throw in a bunch of other alloying elements, which ordinarily would create high hardenability, but there's no carbon that's been hardened. So you've kind of gone to a whole new regime. Why would you use uh, gas? You were saying that you use uh, gas metal work? Welding a lot of times on uh, instead of you know like stick welding or something like that in shipyards. Well, you got the sixty percent versus thirty percent productivity factor, right? Right, I understand that, but I mean, what well, my experience was, it almost always on the big small cuts and stuff. They would use stick welding. Is there like a drawback? Is it oh. harder to stick welding? Is very portable. You won't find anything more portable. The gas metal arc, you got the tank of gas, you got the power supply, you can break the power supply. I mean, stick welder, you just you know, you don't have to bring any gas bottles. It's a simple little stinger, you know, clamp that holds the thing, rather than a great big torch. So it turns out there is so much art that's going to these things. You can get very high toughness in these stick electrodes. So long as you get moisture down low enough, you don't get hydrogen cracking, you can sometimes get better toughness with those than you can with the gas metal art. That's not really the reason. In the shipyard, it's more a question of convenience. If, if I if I could, or, or accessibility, I mean, you could obviously get this in to a foundation in a tight corner, 
<laughs> people bend these things and weld the mirrors you know, blind. Okay, um, you have to be careful when you bend them. The flux breaks off, and you can't weld. Then you're, if you if you weld past where you have your flux coating, you're going welding with a bare steel wire, and you're going to get porosity. Okay, but but a lot of times it's accessibility. Sometimes it's just the convenience of not having to carry around a bunch of heavy stuff. Okay, but you have to pay the price of productivity. Okay? If you got room to get that great big torch in there, you'd much rather use a torch in most cases. Industry, if you go to a John Deere or a Caterpillar, you don't find stick electrodes anymore. Okay, first of all, those well, you have a hard time finding the welders. Okay, plus they got the same parts and they can fixture it and they can have a little gantry that carries the gas metal arc torch along. They want the productivity. The shipyard, you got to bring the, the arc to the piece. You can't bring the piece to the arc. Okay. So stick electrode is still great for that. Stick electrode is still, well, when when I started out in, in the mid-70s, stick electrodes, oh, I'm sorry, wait, um, it, stick electrodes were 60% of the market and gas metal arc was 30. Now it's kind of reversed, okay? Just because of the productivity thing. Okay. Well, microstructures, if you're going to high strength steels, and we are going to ever higher strength steels, uh, commercially and uh, 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 for defense applications because you want lighter weight, you want lower cost, you know. Uh, so you're always going to these seals that are higher strength which give you higher residual stresses. So how do we control it? Well, we try to make sure we, if we're using flux shielded processes, we make sure we dry the flux. And even if you're using the submerged arc process, I haven't spent a lot of time talking about different welding processes. Gas tungsten arc with a tungsten electrode. The tungsten doesn't melt off, you just have an arc and it melts the base material. You have gas metal arc, sometimes called MIG, is what the British call it, for metal inert gas, where you have a steel or an aluminum electrode or whatever metal you're melting, it could be nickel based alloy, and you're feeding that wire in with these rolls, little, little rollers, and it melts off and it fills up the groove. So you're melting off the wire and filling it up. That's gas metal arc. There's also submerged arc, which um, you have a moving wire, a steel wire, feeding in, and here's your plate, and you basically cover the top with something that looks like sand. And it's called a submerged arc because you strike the arc underneath this, and the gas pressure of the expanding gases here pushes back, and the, the molten, the sand melts, and you end up with a little molten glass layer. It's a melted glass layer with an arc underneath. You can look at it, it's just like looking at a bunch of sand with a little gas popping up every now and then. How many people have ever seen submerged arc? You didn't get a demo in my lab. We haven't done submerged arc for 15 years, but we used to do a lot of it. But submerged arc is also used in the shipyards. It can only be done in a flat position. It makes very big welds, very, very high productivity. Typically on a panel line where you bring in the plates and you're just welding the plates together to make bigger plates, and then you're going to put stiffeners on them. This is uh, panel lines are more not, not subs, but surface ships. Certainly in a commercial shipyard, you have big panel lines. Quite often it's submerged, submerged arc. Very high productivity process. In fact, we believe this is the process which we, well, we know this process was patented by Union Carbide as union, the Union Melt process in 1936. We believe this is what Franklin Roosevelt was referring to in the middle of World War II when he said that this, he talked about a welding process that had made it possible to build all these delivery ships. And we believe that he was talking about submerged dark, but he didn't say submerged dark, so we don't know what we think. I mean, the other welding processes had already been around, but this one was invented in 1936, and he talked about this new welding process that was helping in the, in the war. In any case, so that's submerged dark, and it has a flux. And in the shipyard, you go down an electric boat, um, well, actually, they, they may not be used as much, well, certainly on the old 848, uh, they use a lot of submerged arc. Right? Lincoln has an electro uh, flux called 880 uh, that typically was used for H-1A um, as a submerged arc flux. Anyway, you have to dry the sand, if you will, and then you can redry it, so far as that goes. But the other ways to help eliminate the hydrogen are preheat, postheat, and then these last two have to be ways to eliminate the stress. If you look at these three things that can cause the hydrogen cracking. After class, someone 
yesterday uh, or last week asked me what's the difference between hydrogen cracking and hydrogen embrittlement? Well, cracking is when the crack forms and embrittlement is the steel can be embrittled without cracking. Okay, so there is a slight difference between those two. What's the difference between hydrogen cracking and delayed cracking? There is none. Two names for the same thing. Okay, delayed cracking occurs a few hours after you finish the welding process due to hydrogen embrittlement. The hydrogen embrittles the steel as it moves around and it causes cracking. So delayed cracking is hydrogen cracking caused by the hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, there's lots of different terms that are thrown around for some of these same things. There are minor distinctions that we don't have to get into. But in other ways, in addition to trying to get the moisture out of the system, you can preheat the weld metal. Uh, not the weld metal, but you can preheat the base plate. And actually, preheat is one of the larger single costs in a uh, military shipyard because you typically have to preheat these high strength submarine steels. Okay? Um, and a typical preheat might be 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, when they had the first Seawolf problem, they were going to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. If you can imagine welding in a 400 degree Fahrenheit preheated A crate construction, they used to have what they called the blue jelly suits. Anybody ever hear about the blue jelly suits? They basically, I mean, the welder might be might be on a little creeper type railroad track, you know, on his back, and he had to go inside the foundation to weld. If anyone's ever been to some of these things, complex things, and he would wear this blue jelly suit. They would pump fluid through the suit, but he was basically in a chilled suit, okay, to keep to keep him cool, because he was literally going inside a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven to do the welding. You don't like to have to preheat. They had to go to the higher preheat when they were welding the HY100 for the Seawolf because they had a very high carbon welding electrode and that had led to hydrogen cracking that they didn't expect, okay? And so the preheat temperatures, in order to get back in business, and, you know, preheat um, gets rid of the yeah, hydrogen. Preheat gets rid of the hydrogen, actually does several levels. Um, but preheat, if this is my weld that I'm gonna make, I preheat the base plates such that after the weld is made, this is weld metal, right? I have a heat effector zone on either side. And this is the base plate. So I may preheat for a distance of one foot on either side. And typically you can preheat with flames, but the shipyard doesn't like that because you can overheat with flames. And therefore you can lose the properties of the steel, which has been quenched and tempered to get the straight. So the shipyard typically uses electric resistance heaters. And I think typical shipyard, 25% of the electricity in the shipyard, between 25 and 50% of the electricity in the shipyard is going for preheating in a submarine yard. Okay. Just to heat up the steel. And what it does, if you, if you look at the susceptibility to hydrogen cracking versus temperature, where this is 20 degrees centigrade, which is room time 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is 120, which is you know 250, and this is um, minus 120, or minus 80, or something. I think that yeah, gets me something. The susceptibility to hydrogen cracking looks like this. It maximizes right around room temperature. It tails off down here because the hydrogen is so cold that it doesn't move around very fast. It's still there but it's not diffusing to the bad, to the inclusions and other harmful areas of the steel. Here, you're too cold for the hydrogen to move and do its damage. Here, the hydrogen is moving so fast that it actually bakes out. It gets, it just diffuses out of the steel. I often say it's just like if you open up a, um, a ginger ale and pour it into a glass, you see the CO2 bubbles slowly diffusing and coming out. And as you come back a day later, it, the whole thing's flat, right? Well, it's a similar kinetics. If I heat up steel to two, three, four hundred degrees, the hydrogen will diffuse out in a few hours. We talked about heat treating of steels, and you have to put the if you're plating the steels and or or pickling the steel, and that can introduce hydrogen from the chemical reaction of pickling or from the the reaction from the electroplating operation, you can introduce hydrogen into a, a, a steel. You have to, the, 
ASTM now has a spec that says you should put it in the baking furnace within one hour of doing the process, one to four hours. I know one spec that for wire, high strength piano wire, says you need to put it in the furnace within 15 minutes. I know one spec for a helicopter mass where they basically say you go directly from the heat treating furnace, or heat, heat treating the plating operation, you go directly in less than a minute to the furnace, the, the baking furnace, to bake out the hydrogen. So just at, um, at uh, room temperature, it may take days, several days, for the hydrogen to completely diffuse out, depending on how thick the thing is. It's an eighth of an inch thick, the hydrogen might all diffuse out in a few, few hours. If it's four inches thick, it could take a week or more. If I heat it up to 375F or 250 degrees C, it will diffuse out within a couple of hours rather than a couple of days. So I just speed it up and I'm getting rid of the hydrogen. It's super saturated in there. It wants to leave just like the CO2 in the, in the ginger ale wants to leave on its own. You just need a little temperature to boost it along. So by preheating, if I preheat to let's say 200 degrees, um, Fahrenheit, and then I weld, well the heat effect is on from the weld is even hotter, right? And so this cools faster, allows more time. This might, this is gonna cool much faster through the 400 degree Fahrenheit range because it's, the, the heat sink that it's cooling into is 200 degrees rather than 70 degrees. So preheat slows the cooling rate, allowing more time for the hydrogen to diffuse out. And your residual hydrogen, when the thing finally cools down, is less. You can also, if that's not good enough, you can do what's called post heating. After you weld, you keep the temperature on the base plate, and now you're basically doing the baking operation as you go. And post heating is just a post baking operation. But in welding, we call it preheat and post heat. Post heat gets really expensive. After the Seawolf problem, they were doing post heating as well. And in fact, on the thicker foundations, and typically about the thickest you get in a, in a uh, submarine hull is about four inches. Uh, but, but on a, if I remember correctly, so let's say this is the original weld prep on a two inch thick weld. They had some sort of spec where basically they could only weld about three quarters of an inch thick before they had to do a four hour post heat. They had to stop welding and just heat it, keep it warm for four hours to allow the hydrogen to diffuse out before they could continue welding. So every, I don't remember if it was every half inch or every three quarters inch, but the specs that the electric boat wrote after the sea wolf problem, not only did they have to preheat to higher temperatures and people had to well, wear blue jelly suits in some cases, and they only could stay in there for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes at a time. Can you imagine what happened to the cost of welding? I mean, the productivity went, you know, like that. So the cost went the other way, right? Um, but as they learned more, they eventually got away from that, so they don't use blue jelly suits anymore. Um, but they had to get back into production. You couldn't keep telling Congress we're going to shut down the shipyard for two years because they would just cancel the program. You know, after about being shut down for four or five months, you basically, at any cost, you know, you just had to be able to tell Congress, well, we're back welding. That's, you know, that's the sound like they need. But if you had, had to go and say, well, we won't have enough data to weld economically for another year and a half, Congress says, oh, you don't need that sound right, right? Um, anyway, um, so they had this thing where they would basically uh, stop the process, post heat for four hours to drive off the hydrogen, and then you could put some more in there. Because if you went to a full four inches thick, you could bury the hydrogen in there and it won't get out for weeks. The rate at which something diffuses out is the distance heat diffuse when something diffuses is proportional to the square root of the diffusivity times time. A typical diffusivity might be 10 to the minus, a high diffusivity, 10 to the minus six centimeters square per second. Uh, and if I'm talking 3,600 seconds an hour, three hours is 10,000 seconds. So 10 to the fourth, right? 10,000 seconds, this is three hours. 
and I take the square root of all that, that's 10 to the minus 1 centimeters. Did I get that right? That means the hydrogen is only diffused a tenth of, of one millimeter in three hours at room temperature. If I go up to three, four hundred degrees, this number may be 10 to the minus four. Now it's going to diffuse out several centimeters, okay, in distance in that amount of time, order of magnitude, okay? Uh, so that's probably enough for today. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll finish up the welding and the steel. But basically, preheat post, post heat are ways to try to cook the hydrogen out. It also can help temper the weld metal. Uh, and we'll talk about stress relieving and painting as a way to get rid of stresses for the next time. Let me put up these graphs again. We talked about carbon equivalent before and how you like to have low carbon equivalent. Uh, which means low carbon content as well. Zone two is where traditional steels have been. Uh, the difficult to weld steels we've had for years, which are way up here. If you want to know where an HY 130 is, it's up here. Uh, and the HY 130 is about right here. One of the problems with it. HY 100 or HY 180 have the same carbon equivalent, the same composition, except for just different tempering temperature. Uh, somewhere in here. Difficult to weld steels. Uh, this is the most difficult region. Now we developing steels down here. Now what is the carbon equivalent? The carbon equivalent is carbon content plus manganese. One, one form is manganese over six, silicon over 24, nickel over 40, chromium over five, moly over four. Basically it's a measure of the hardenability of steel. How easily will the, form, will the steel form this martensite? site? This untempered martensite, very hard uh, material. Uh, the hardness depends on the carbon content, get the carbon content down, but also it depends on the hardenability. Um, the preheat required as a function of the carbon equivalent falls in some little band here. This is the preheat temperature to avoid hydrogen induced cracking. And you can see these temperatures, this is degree C. Uh, if I'm talking about an HY. Uh, 80, I'm talking about something around maybe 0.45, and you're seeing preheat temperatures in the 200 degrees F range. Surprise, surprise for any of you who've been through a submarine yard. Okay? You have to heat the steels. If you try to heat them down here, there is a rule that steels, if you look at the ASME boiler pressure vessel code, it says you shall not weld below 50 degrees Fahrenheit unless you preheat the steel. Even if you have a steel that has very low carbon equivalent, it does not require preheating. You are not allowed to weld that below 50 degrees Fahrenheit without preheating. Why? You might have an idea. Because you start to get condensation. The amount of moisture in the air at 100% humidity uh, at 75 degrees Fahrenheit is 5%. 5% of the air is moisture at 100% humidity at 75 degrees. Well, uh, it turns out you go lower down to 50 degrees or below and that moisture actually condenses on things. You see it as dew on things. There is a moisture layer on this table right here. I can't see it, I can't feel it, but there's a thin layer, a few model layers. If this room was at 32 degrees, there might be 10 times as many model layers or layers of moisture. And so you actually are gonna be welding over water unless you preheat the steel to get it above 50 degrees. Okay, so you're just driving off a little bit of moisture. Uh, off the steel. And that little bit of moisture can be significant, which is why the boiler and pressure vessel code will not allow you to weld any steel unless it's above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Not the atmospheric temperature, but the steel temperature. Okay. Uh, so anyway, this just shows you there is a very strong correlation between the carbon equivalent. And there's lots of different ways to measure carbon equivalent, but the carbon equivalent and the preheat temperature. So we talked last time about the fact that hydrogen cracking, you need hydrogen, which is moisture typically, or oils. You need stress and you need a microstructure. And we use preheat and postheat as ways to heat the thing up either before the welding process or after the welding process to either dry the moisture off or to allow the hydrogen to diffuse away. And very thick things like four inch thick weldments can take days for the hydrogen to diffuse out. Uh, in general, the hydrogen will not stay in the steel 
more than a few days or even just a few hours. However, I have seen a special case um, of a weld in California that created a lot of damage when it failed, where the hydrogen was trapped in it for a year. Uh, it happened to be frozen in the high Sierra, had ice on it. If you remember, if you freeze, if you get cooler, the hydrogen doesn't move. And it also turns out that if you have porosity, the British Welding Institute has shown that if you have fine porosity in your weld metal, the hydrogen can be trapped in that fine porosity for long periods of time. And if it's in the steel, if it's in the matrix, it diffuses out. But if I have very fine porosity, well, that's just nothing more than a container to hold hydrogen. There is an interfacial reaction between the hydrogen gas and the hydrogen diffused in the steel that keeps it. I mean, in, inside the pores, I have molecular hydrogen, H2. Dissolved in the steel, I have atomic hydrogen, and atomic hydrogen is nothing more than a proton. So protons will diffuse out. Molecular hydrogen will not diffuse across the steel gas interface. I, I contain, contain hydrogen in a steel tank. So if I have porosity in the steel, the hydrogen can go migrate to that porosity. It might it'll go out to the atmosphere, will also go to the pores. And it can be trapped in the pores. And then if you then stress the steel, which is what happened, this was a, this was a 22 foot diameter pipe that had 180 PSI water in it. This was a pumped water storage project for a utility. They had a nuclear reactor, and at night people don't use their electricity, but the nuclear reactor likes to run continuously. It doesn't like peaks and valleys in this operation. So they, they built this pumped water storage project for $800 million. And 22 foot diameter pipe going for about I don't know, 10 miles from one lake up at 8,000 feet to another lake at 5,000 feet. And they, first time they, a year after they built this thing, they loaded up, loaded up with water. The head of water was 188 psi, so you can figure out about 0.42, which is fresh water's density per foot. You can figure out, divide uh, 188 by 0.42, and you can find out how far above you the, the upper lake was. And after they loaded it up, 18 hours later, fortunately, just after all the construction crews had left the valley. There were only two guys left in the valley. They had got permission to cut some firewood and take it home with them. And they were cutting firewood. They heard a crack, and the guy looks over and sees water start to spew out of this this uh, this 22 foot diameter pipe. When it let go, it was four million horsepower. There was a 200 foot granite cliff across this canyon. It ate away 100 feet of that that cliff. We just moved the cliff 100 feet back. It took them an hour and a half to shut the valve off. These are big valves. Um, and by the time they'd done that, the upper lake had dropped half of its volume down to the lower lake, and it all ran down. They built a new, new beach at the lower lake, okay? Uh, and they wiped out a lot of bears, and muskrats, and things like that, raccoons. Uh, but no one got hurt. Um, nonetheless, the reason that one failed is because it had a hydrogen induced crack. There were, they, these were big pipes, they had to fabricate them on site. They'd bring up sections and they'd weld them together up in the high Sierra at 8,000 feet, or actually 7,000 feet at this site. And they were welding. It started snowing at the end of September. They were welding after Thanksgiving. They shut it in December 10th, and everyone went home for the season because there was so much snow around. You, before Thanksgiving, there's a picture showing about a foot of snow inside the pipe. And these guys were welding on this manway underneath the pipe. It wasn't clear if anyone bothered to shovel the snow off the back side of the pipe. Okay? I mean, we don't know. But we know there was a hydrogen crack. We also know they didn't bother to stress relieve. In this particular structure, the pressure vessel code says you must stress relieve after welding. Why? This was an inch and a quarter thick. Um, and an inch and a quarter, you can get yield level residual stresses. You need to keep the hydrogen down, which they probably didn't do because it was cold weather. Oh, by the way, the supervision went home just before Thanksgiving. So these guys were, were unsupervised after Thanksgiving when they were welding this. So that's why we don't know exactly what happened. Um, 
you have to keep the stresses down. And what are the stresses? Well, the stresses are the shrinkage stresses. You know, I'm going to make a weld in something, and I have a groove. In this case, it's a fillet weld around a man weight. And as you fill this up, it turns out it had another weld up here. And then they had something on the back side here. Um, but this shrinks, the metal shrinks. It would want to distort like that, but it's in a circular structure. It can't distort like that. So the distortion that would have caused the thing to shrink up like that becomes a residual stress equivalent to the stress that would have been necessary to pull it back into, into alignment, right? Because it was in alignment. It was a circle. It couldn't, couldn't move. It was fully restrained. And they had a crack right there a third of the way through. Okay, Why only a third of the way through? Because if you look at the residual stresses, they tend to be uh, tensile on one side and compressible on the other side. You just think they're more complex than this. But the simple model is just something like this. At the neutral axis, they're zero. If I go a third of the way through, the stress I run out of stress to drive the crack. So surprise, surprise, the crack is to start to move towards the neutral axis, runs out of stress. Yep. How would you stress relieve that? You stress relieve this particular structure by heating it to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. At 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, the yield stress of the steel drops by about 50%. And so I knock off those high stresses and I end up with something like that. In fact, for other reasons, I actually get something that's even better than that. I probably reduce 75, 80% of my residual stresses, even though and it's mostly because the stress stays more complex than I've driven drawn for you, okay? But you can, you can, you can consume 75 to 80 percent of your residual stresses by heating up for an hour at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the typical reduction in strength of the steel at 1200 is about half, you lose about half of your yield strength of your steel. Now you regain it when you cool back down to room temperature. And you haven't destroyed the temper or things like that uh, in general. HY80 is tempered at around 1100. So it doesn't have a lot of residual stresses in it, uh, so far as that goes. From a practical standpoint, up in the mountains, how do you get the pipe that hot? You, you build furnaces up in the mountains like that. Big furnaces that go Big around furnaces. the pipe, yep. and they seal onto it? Yep. Actually, they do local local heating, but they build a little a little furnace around the thing. But I mean, even around a 22-foot diameter pipe, they there are companies, and you, it can cost you a million dollars for the heating to build the furnace to do the stress relief on pipe. <coughs> in a shop, they'll have a furnace that could be five times the size of this room, and they just put whole, whole structures into furnace, great big furnaces and heat them up to 1,200 degrees. But local stress relief is something that people do all the time in the field for these big structures, but that drives the cost of the structure, too. So you don't go after it with a torch, so? No. You stay away from torches as much as you can because you can't control the overheating on the surface. Okay. They, they use them, but you try to avoid it. So stress relief, this is thermal stress relief. We've already talked about the fact that something like a submarine has a thick enough weld uh, that you're going to have yield level residual stresses. It can be thicker than an inch and a quarter. And the way you do that is you do mechanical stress relief. You, in some other structures, um, pressure vessels, internal pressure vessels, Sometimes you have to do a proof test at 125% of the operating stress or pressure. And that's a mechanical stress relief. Because if I already have, if you're to use the same diagram in a different way, if my service stress is going to be 50% of my yield, and I go to a, a 50 or 25% above that, I will cause some yielding and some reduction in residual stresses. Okay, if I actually had a residual stress that was at yield, and I go 25% above that, I'm going to get local yielding, which re relieves the residual stresses. Is that okay? No, I'm just I'm thinking through uh, sometimes when I uh, do some, uh, I don't know if it's the same thing, but uh, both have it. And you put it, uh, see the 125, 150% right after it was put in. Uh, right. It was a weight test on one hand, but on the other hand, it was also, I wonder if it was also structurally tough. Or, How thick was it? Anything under three eighths of an inch is doesn't need stress relief. You don't have; they're not thick enough. They won't build up yeah, severe enough stresses. So, but if it's something that's an inch thick, 
and you stress it to 125 to 150 percent a half inch, you might have been doing a little stress relief, but it wasn't it wasn't a big time stress relief. Anything below three eighths of an inch, there's really no need to stress relief it in general. Not in the co uh, common steel. There, there are some special steels that maybe you need to stress relief, but but uncommon. Those are uncommon things. In general, when you get above three three quarters of an inch or greater, you can do some good by stress relief, either mechanical or thermal. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, do people ever use like eddy current heating in metals to do stress relief, to like inducing? Well, they do induction heating, which is eddy current heating. Okay, induction heating, you're changing the magnetic field, and yes, they do use induction heating for stress relief. Most of it is electrical resistance. Some of it is gas fired. The typical gas fired, you actually build a chamber and you actually protect the surface of the steel from seeing direct impingement of the flame, which you can't control. Sometimes they actually build an insulating layer against the steel, and then they build a chamber around that and they gas fire the, the annulus, okay, to heat the whole thing. There's lots of different ways to do it. And like I say, it's an expensive enough part of the process. People who do this know how to calculate what the most effective way is. And induction heating often does, is often used. Particularly, actually, induction heating is quite frequently used on a production line where you have smaller parts, not huge pressure vessels, but smaller parts that need to be stress relieved. You just you know, put an induction coil around it and heat it up quickly, and then you can stress relieve it that way. But it has enough induction heating to clean so Induction it's heating warm. is just a, from a 10 kilohertz uh, to a megahertz magnetic field. Right. Just a, and so the magnetic field is. Um, big coil goes around it, just a circular coil, usually um, at a high frequency, and it sets up magnetic fields. I mean, you get magnetic field diffusion into the material, <laughs> it builds an electrical conductor, and then it generates currents, internal currents, by the changing field. And those currents resistively heat the material. Okay, it's called induction heating. You're using the inductance of the material. It's basically, it's the core of the transformer, if you will. And you have to do a mechanical relieving right after you've done a weld? Well, you, the, the, the mechanic, if, if you don't have a lot of hydrogen, you don't necessarily, stress, the residual stress is, if you've got hydrogen present and you're doing it because of hydrogen, you have to do it within one to four hours. But in general, you also have to do it because you're worried about brittle fracture. In not just hydrogen, but brittle fracture. I have, if I have a flaw and I have residual stresses in the structure in addition to the surface stresses, I could exceed at the tip of that flaw the brittle fracture initiation condition. So typically on a pressure vessel, they're not worried as much about hydrogen. They have pretty good procedures to control the hydrogen, but they are worried about brittle fracture. The same thing in a uh, submarine. They have pretty good procedures to avoid the hydrogen getting in there to begin with but they're still worried about potential brittle fracture. When you talk about peening or anything like that, yeah. is there a rhyme or reason to how hard you have to hit, like what, what you have to do, or is it? It's very empirical. Okay, and peening, I haven't thought of it, but thank you, I'll now talk, start talking about peening. <laughs> Another way to do local mechanics, just like you can do, you can put the whole pressure vessel in a furnace to do thermal stress relief, or you can just do a local heater and just locally heat it, you can, stress the whole thing by proof testing it, internal pressure of a pressure vessel or external pressure on a submarine, okay, to mechanically stress relieve the whole thing. You can also do local stress relief, which is just peening it, hitting, hitting it with a hammer over and over. How much do you do that? Well, the typical technique is you take an almond gauge, A-L-M-E-N. An almond gauge is a strip of steel or whatever material you're gonna be peening that's about one inches by four inches, and you hit it on the surface, and it's typically like maybe a millimeter thick, and you see how much it distorts, because you're introducing compressive surface stresses, right? And so it will, it starts out flat, and after you've been banging on it, it will bow, and you measure the height of the bow. <laughs> Pretty empirical, right? <laughs> okay. And some engineer says, well, if I get 20,000s bow in the almond gauge, that's how much I want you to paint. How do you decide how much, based on just looking at the weld, how much residual stress do 
kind of experience. You ask the old guy, and he says this is the way you do it, and you ask him to answer why, and he says don't ask questions. <laughs> not like what I'm telling you right now. I mean, there is no, there is no science to peeing. And in fact, I told you the story. What is it, Iowa, that had the explosion down in Puerto Rico? They never repaired part of that structure because they did not know how to weld 14 inch thick armor plate. We know that they would weld with stick electrodes. It might be 500 or 1,000 passes with an old stick electrode in World War II to build that, that, uh, that ship with that armor plate. And we know that after maybe a half an inch worth of passes buildup, they would stop and they would peen. Someone would go in there with a, you know, a, an air uh, tool and just bang, 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 peen it. But you know, there was, the control was, well, peen it, you know, for a while. And hope it doesn't crash. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, there was, they weren't even, probably weren't even using almond gauges. You know, the guy learned in the shop when he was being taught how to weld, well, you peen it for three minutes, you know, or you peen it until your arm gets tired, or you peen it, you know. <laughs> you know and you hope you got the right compressor pressure, you know. Uh, it's a peening. Peening is fine as a stress relief technique in a production environment where you shot peen, where you basically put it into a chamber and you basically just shoot uh, uh, little spheres, steel spheres at it or whatever. Because that actually can be fairly reproducible. And you, you're making the same, you're making 100,000 of the same part, and you actually can, can have done some tests and do fatigue tests on it after it was peened to, to prove that it actually has a decent fatigue life within limits. But for welds, are you kidding me? It's, it's an art. Okay, and it's art. It's an uncontrolled art. Um, for some steels, it's the only way you can do it without cracking. And, and actually, what they found is, hey, if we peened it, we didn't get a crack, and so it must be good. But that was the criteria. You know, uh, there's not a science to it, and it's. I have never specified painting in any in any well, except for that one case I told you on the titanium uh, inlet top of a, a turbine back when I worked for the Naval Air Reward Facility in Norfolk when I was 19 years old and had to sign off on this engine. And he said, I'll go to jail if the engine uh, crashes. Well, you know, I think that engine after 32 years is probably no, no longer in service, or at least it's been back for repair since then. Uh, so I probably don't have to worry about my my exposure being you know, taken to jail because the engine crashes. But, um, and I didn't specify that. Another engineer specified peening stress relief. But um, I have never, Specify peening as a stress relief technique because it's it's uncontrolled. Um, that's not to say I wouldn't ever do it if I had, didn't have any other choice. But I usually try to figure some other choice. Okay. Um, and I, in general, I don't. I can't even think right now. I've seen a couple of procedures in my life where it said peening is desirable or something, but I, I just don't see it. People don't use it as much as they used to. But that was the only way we could weld armor plate. And one of the reasons we don't know how to weld armor plate today is because people, you know, kind of lost the art of peening. So if you want to kind of get into a real niche market, <laughs> you can go practice it. <laughs> okay? Any other questions? I think we finished steel. I didn't get to titanium today. But, uh, we can finish steel. Unless you have other questions.